Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, realize a few people are still coming in, but that's probably good. Uh, my name is Dave Meyer. I work with ATD Fourth World US, and uh, I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on the experience of poverty in the US, insights from ATD Fourth World new research. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of how this will play out today, how you can ask questions, how you can participate, and then we'll go ahead and pass the floor on to our different presenters. Um, first off, to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you, questions, comments, concerns. Uh, you can join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag NoPoverty. You can hit us up at our account at atd 4 world underscore US. You can also add your questions to the chat. You see that on the right-hand side of the screen. My colleague in New York, Carolyn, will be keeping an eye on that chat and she'll make sure that all the questions people put in there get sent out to the right spot. We're not going to be stopping throughout for questions. We'll just be um, taking a moment for Q&A at the end where we'll try and go through all of them at once. So we do hope that uh, all of you will take the time to put your questions in there as they come to you. Uh, we really have some interesting and informed people on here today, so it'll be fun. Second, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, just to let you know, on June 26th, we have another webinar scheduled, The Experience of Poverty as Subjugation. That title would probably mean a lot more to you uh, as we get a bit <laughs> through the research from today. We'll have presentations from Marianne Broxton from ATD Fourth World, who's also speaking with us today, as well as Anuradha Mittal at the Oakland Institute, and Lenin Rahman, who works for an NGO in Bangladesh called Mati. Uh, that webinar is going to focus specifically on subjugation, which is one of the key findings of our research here in the U.S., and what that means on the international level, how that is experienced in other countries, if it's experienced in other countries, and how international institutions can kind of reinforce that dynamic. Um, for more information on that event, or just to download the MAP report and learn more about the research, see videos, interviews, things like that, you can visit our website, map.fourthworldmovement.org. And as always, you can hit us up uh, by email at communications at fourthworldmovement.org. Um, but now to talk a little bit more about why we're here today and the research here in the U.S. Uh, for those of you who don't know ATD Fourth World, we're an international movement founded by people living in poverty to put themselves forward as partners in the fight to end poverty. ATD Fourth World was founded in France 60 years ago by a Catholic priest named Joseph Rosinski, and he started ATD with a promise that if families living in this emergency housing camp could work together, they could build something so powerful that the president of France, that the secretary general of the United Nations, the Pope in the Vatican would be obliged to listen and obliged to, to take note. And that was successful. And since the 1980s, in particular, ATD Fourth World has had consultative status, general consultative status at the United Nations in New York. And it was as part of that role that ATD Fourth World conducted a participatory research in 2012, evaluating the Millennium Development Goals. And for those of you who remember, the Millennium Development Goals were the kind of principles guiding international development for many years. Um, and they were eventually replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals. And that research project was really important in influencing the direction those new Sustainable Development Goals took. Um, and in the Sustainable Development Goals, there's this key phrase, to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. And of course, it's a phrase which begs the question, what are the forms of poverty? And then who gets to define what the forms of poverty are? Who gets to decide that? Um, in the US, as many international institutions, we tend to define poverty monetarily. So we say either you're earning X dollars and that's the poverty line, you're either above the threshold or below the threshold, and that's how we decide who's in poverty. But is that what poverty is really like for people who live it? And how could we go about finding out? And so for the past three years, ATD Fourth World has been working with Oxford University to conduct a participatory research in six countries around the world. So that's Tanzania, Bangladesh, Bolivia, France, the UK, and the United States, to try and get to the sense of what poverty is like for those who live it every day. And today we're gonna to talk about the results in the US and what we can learn about poverty in the US when we listen and build participatory research with people who are living in poverty. Uh, the presenters you're going to be hearing from are all members of the U.S. National Research Team. So that's the group that got together and has been coordinating and managing this project for the past few years. Uh, they really know this research in and out, through and through. If you have any questions, I even know there's some members of the research team in the audience too. So if you have any questions, uh, we can even hit on them. But I've been trying to uh, stump them and confuse them for 
for about a year now, and, and I haven't found a way to do it. So maybe you can you can try. Um, first, I'm going to pass the floor to Guillaume Charvon. Guillaume is going to speak a bit more about the overall research, and particularly the methodology and how the research was conducted. Um, Guillaume was co-director of the National Map Research and is based with our team in New York. So Guillaume, take it away. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you all for being here listening to research. So as Dave was saying, over the last three years, with Marianne Broxton, Sean Oshley that you will hear today, but also with the other members of our research team, we have conducted the MAP research. MAP stands for uh, multidimensional aspects of poverty. And it was a participatory research uh, that tried to, to understand what poverty really is about here in the United States. But before Marianne and Sean give us an overview of our key findings, I would like to share a little bit more about our methodology and how specifically it, it, uh, we build this research. What was the methodology used for the multidimensional aspect of poverty? We were inspired by a methodology developed by your organization, it the first world, in Europe over the last two decades. This methodology is called the merging knowledge. It is based on the principle that poverty should be understood from three perspectives. The perspective of academic researcher, the one developed by professional working alongside people living in poverty, like social workers, and also, most importantly, the one brought by people living in poverty themselves. And those three perspectives should come together, should be combined to give the full picture of what is, uh, what is poverty. Uh, as you know, each type of knowledge, each stream, if you want, has its own value by itself and it's needed. But none of them taken separately provide a holistic view of what is poverty. By putting them together in an interactive way, they can merge. And their merging offers an understanding of poverty that is more than the sum of each part. The so merging of knowledge is about how we can combine those three types of knowledge. And it allows each voice is to be heard and to find harmony with the others. That was kind of the general uh, framework of our methodology. But how does it work really more concretely? Uh, this project, the map and the merging knowledge developed uh, through it, was built around two main structures. The first one is a research team, and they've introduced it a little bit. And the second one is a peer group. For us, the research team was really the leading block. Our team uh, was in charge of designing the research and to implement it and to analyze the data. It is really a key element of why the margin of knowledge is participatory research on steroids. This team was composed by two academics, two practitioners, and six activists, which means in our jargon, people living in poverty that are committed to impulse positive change for themselves, their family, and their community. The proportion, the weight was intentional to give from the beginning more weight to the knowledge of people with a direct experience of poverty in this research. So this thing was also very diverse. And we tried to be to build something that's, I mean, diverse in terms of racial and sexual identities, age, social background, etc. It was also complementary in terms of being enmeshed in several realities, cultural realities across the US. For that, we needed to learn how to work at the distance. But that was not all the main challenge we faced. The main challenge was to address the power at play in our team. Because, I mean, you can understand that just putting this, uh, us together in this team, I mean, didn't work like magically. So during our first meeting as a research team, Johnny, who was a, who is an activist from New York, a member of our team, made a comment. It was a constant guide for, for all of us.
Hi, sorry, it looks like we may be having some uh, technical issues there with our team in New York. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> the, uh, always struck by how um, it seems like we'll have great internet connection in places like New York, and yet oftentimes it's as hard as, a, as we're connecting to places in the developing world. Um, so we're going to skip, maybe we'll come back to Guillaume, give him a chance to finish later on, uh, since it looks like he's been knocked offline. Um, the next part of our presentation is going into kind of the details of what the key findings were in the map report. Um, that will be, uh, we're going to have Sean Ashley and Marianne Broxton joining us. Sean and Mary was co-director of the research along with Guillaume, and Sean was a member of the national research team along with everyone here. Um, He's based in Gallup, New Mexico, and is joining us on the phone, which is nice because it gives me an excuse to share this really cool photo I have of him. So you guys get a sense at least of what Sean looks like. Uh, Marianne and Sean, I'll pass on the phone. Go for it. Oh. Sean, thank you. Hello. Hello, Hi, Sean. Mary Ann. <laughs> Hi, I'm having some issue with my phone, so um, I think I got it working. Wonderful. Okay, so, hi, my name is Sean. Hi, my name is Sean Ashley. I'm from Gallup. I was I was a, a part of the peer group, the activist peer group here in Gallup. Um, and I'm also part of the national research team, along with uh, Gia, Marianne, Marlon, um, Julia, Donna, and Amelia, and Kim. So um, I hope I'm not missing anybody. Um, but yeah, like I guess uh, what I'd like to maybe, maybe talk a little bit about today um, during this webinar um, is one of the, the dimensions that um, I felt really defined what it's what it is what it's like to to live out here in um, I guess my part of the US here on the, the southwest side um, I was kind of surprised to to hear when I was when I was traveling with the research team you know just if someone asked where I came from and I said the Southwest and New Mexico and Arizona, how um, I was always shocked at the the responses I would get or reactions. Um, not very many people, I guess, are familiar with the geography and they don't know where I'm from. Um, and that kind of just really shed a little bit more light on <clears throat> uh, this dimension here of subjugation. And that I was kind of feeling, I guess, maybe the effects of that, um, of this this dimension, uh, this term. Um, I think it's a powerful term, um, and it really, I guess, came about in a way that I wasn't. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll shed a little bit of light on why I think the term is important. Um, it came up, I think, in Boston, and I'm not sure who brought it, who brought it about, but it had always been at the back of my mind um, as how Native American peoples are kind of um, have a different experience, a different American uh, experience in America, in that how you know our first meeting and how. You know the wars and the conflict that exists between American peoples um, and Native American peoples, and maybe even here in 
Arizona, where we're also dealing with uh, Mexican rule, you know, we have like a diverse history um, steeped in um, uh, war and tragedy and trauma and combat. And so I think how our path grows out of that is one of subjugation. You know, it's like uh, the Native American experiences that we've never really won. We Things were taken away from us. We were put into this position and forced to live in this position um, as not really totally being free, uh, being independent, being able to think and practice agency and um, <clears throat> make things better for yourself. You're kind of forced to live this existence where you become dependent on um, the government. And that kind of thinking and behavior causes you to be just dependent on everything. You don't really um, get a chance to move, so to speak. So um, it was the, the term was sitting in the back of my head and someone said it and it just kind of made sense. And I was like, well, yeah, I think now we need to go forward and kind of move this dimension along because it really does say something about not just all people in poverty, but I think especially um, uh, the Native Americans um, here, especially, you know, where I'm from. And that's kind of what drew me to the research was, you know, how we were able to to think freely and look about our reality and find out, you know, things that we liked and things that we didn't like and how does that define us and, you know, what does that say about poverty and just, you know, living in this existence, existing in this, this place that has, you know, been created for us. So, um... I think I would like to read just a little bit about it but, uh, from the term itself, from the, the I think uh, the international report, but the one right before. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll start by saying the system is not designed to evolve out of it. It keeps us in constant phase of being below. If there was one answer to the question of why there is poverty, subjugation might be it. Subjugation is a process by which poverty comes about. We don't have all our other dimensions. This report, if we didn't first see a cultural and institutional system in place to exclude large portions of our country from accessing their basic rights. Um, I think that kind of really says a lot. And then I think... It, um, it kind of puts people at odds, and I, I think for me, I kind of see that more since having you know, been a part of this research, and it just seems to be, and even more so now that I'm in this different this different work environment, I'm seeing this this idea of how you know we're there's a small group of of our little workforce that benefits from a larger part and the people that are working harder and doing more have to come from um, harsher places of harsher homes you know uh, the, the travel is longer they, they don't have you know adequate housing most times some of them uh, I think one of the persons I worked with was homeless and so the people that are benefiting from it, maybe two or three owners, you know, uh, they could care less about your situation. You know, you could, you know, I think the feeling there is, you know, if you don't like it, we can take you off the schedule. You know, which is a nice way of saying, we'll just let you go. And that was your choice, and you made that choice, and you have to deal with the consequences. Rather than, you know, just understanding where you come from and what you have to deal with and that you're already at a disadvantage and you have to come from these far off places that most times the danger, the journey is dangerous. You know, if you're hitchhiking on the road and you're coming from 50 miles outside of a border town just to work and you can just hear these stories, you know, oh, this happened on the way, on, on the way to work. This happened on the way to work. And... 
it just kind of feels like it's it's your fault you did that you know it just kind of seems that um it's you know it allows all these other elements other dimensions sub dimensions to come in like racism and um sexism and violence you know it just it just keeps this idea going because to me it feels like native american people have accepted the fact that we have lost this war and therefore we have lost the ability to fight for everything that is pretty much a basic need a basic existence you know to live as as a human being that has been taken away from us because we lost you know and we have to deal with this and the common thing you right here about here in this part of the country is that's the way it is what are you gonna do about us that's, that's how it is and I grew up saying that that's how it is rather than trying to you know enact change you just forced to just deal with it forced to live it you know it just feels like we you know we've been subjugated you know we're living below um, human standards you know just and that's that should be okay with us so um, as I kind of watched this term come about you know like it was just it was in my being you know when we did the peer group here in Gallup and then from when we did the merging and we went to Boston the term was still there you know it's just it, I didn't really say anything it was just there and it kind of showed up on its own in Boston without me you know saying anything about it so that that part you know just watching it and tracking that idea and letting it you know come out on its own you know how we're just putting all of these dimensions together or merging you know racism inequality hardships you know it just naturally kind of just formed this idea of subjugation you know and it just and I felt that wasn't kind of important and I, <clears throat> and I wanted to kind of share a little bit about the dimension and the term and how you know if you read a little bit more into um, into the term you know you'll I think you'll really truly understand what it's like um, for the for the Native American here on this side of of the world um, Marianne Sure, thank you. Um, some of the, the dimensions that I'd like to touch upon today um, that we came up with in the report that you can, as Sean said, you can read when you download the report. Um, one of them is lack of adequate health and well-being. Um, health came up a lot in every one of the 23 peer groups that we conducted across the country. And the one thing that really struck us and stayed with us when we were talking about it and analyzing all the reports is that the health conditions that start in poverty, but when you're younger, the, the idea that there's not an access to healthy food or nutritional food, so it can lead to people having diabetes or di diabetes too. Um, asthma is huge because of the air quality and the environment that you live with. All of these types of illnesses or health conditions that, pe that start in young in life because of, because of poverty in your environment, that they stay with people as life goes on, as they progress, even if their economic circumstances change. So that even if their economic background changes and they are able to move up and out of poverty, the illnesses stay with them. Um, the one, one activist described the healthcare in America is that it's just enough to keep you alive sometimes because we talked about the idea that in, in Appalachia that there may be healthcare providers, but how long does it take you to get there? It's a two hour drive from where we actually held the peer group in another state to go and see healthcare providers. Or they can't get healthcare providers to stay in the area. Or that the hours are short office hours so that it's either during work time. But we also talked about that in urban areas too, the idea that, okay, if there is more healthcare providers, but can you access them? Can you afford a copay? Do you have to decide between food or a copay? Do you 
what do they offer if you have health insurance, but does it also call, cover dental? And does it cover glasses? And does it cover um, mental health ex experiences? Um, so the healthcare was a, a, a big issue. And then also, how does all of that affect your well-being? The, knowing that you're sick and trying to deal with this illness and trying to go on to go to work and try to carry on everyday life. Um, the next one that we talked about was resources, and that covers everything that you normally think about, the basic resources to survive, to live, not just merely survive in a dignified manner. And <laughs> um, and the best way to describe it is a couple of quotes that were given to us by activists. And when we say activists, we mean people with the lived experience of poverty, and that's how they self-identified throughout this research. Um, one activist in the Gallup's men group said, we are controlled by the greed of a few. As Sean was saying, there's a couple of people that are that control everything and everybody else has to try to survive with what's left. Um, an activist in Oakland said, the poorest get the worse. And in Appalachia, it was stated that resources are just enough to set people up to fail. The human to human aspect of service is missing. People are denied services or resources because they fail to meet very stringent eligibility, eligibility criteria. Um, and that's for everything. When we talk about housing, we talk about schools. Do you, are you, how, what is the school like in your area? What is the transportation like in your area? Because you live in a, a, what's called a disadvantaged area. Um, and we also talked about the idea of stigma and shame over and over and over again, no matter who we talked to, um, whether it was in an urban area like New York or Oakland or Boston or whether or New Orleans or whether it was in a rural area like Gallup, New Mexico or Appalachia, everybody said the words, those people and how they were referred to as those people that you didn't want to be bothered with because they were othered by society because of who they were perceived to be, not actually who they were. Um, in Appalachia, they talked about it as being shunned, that a whole family could be shunned or not. The community would look at them as outcasts because of who the community perceived them to be. And that was usually based on poverty. Um, so the stigma that's put on to people and then the shame, how that makes you feel internally. Do you, and how do you react to that? As Sean said, like you start to begin to think, oh, maybe it's me. Maybe there is something wrong with me if this, all of society is telling me this. And how do you deal with that on a daily basis? And do you mask it? Um, some people were talking about the experience of drug use and alcohol use, but when they really got down to it, it was because they were masking the shame that they were made to be feel because of society that was placed on them because of who society perceived them to be. Um, all of this leads to what we call the constants and aggravators that are also there in poverty that affect the dimensions. Um, the constants is something that's always there. And we talked about uncertainty. The idea that yes, nobody, you know, life's uncertain for everybody, but what, for people with the experience of poverty, it ends up being that much harder. Um, it was defined as not waking, waking up in the morning and not knowing how your day is gonna be. Are you gonna experience a no hour work week? Meaning you're, put on the, you're not put on the schedule for work, but you're still employed. So how the next week, when it comes time to get a paycheck and you don't get one, how do you pay your bills? How do you feed your family? All of these things that come out of it. Um, the idea, will you get a no fault eviction? They're, where They just tell you to leave your home because they need the apartment for something else. And then what do you do? The idea of what's going to happen, like is there, a, as we said, healthcare doesn't cover dental or glasses or anything like that. Those are extra things that you need. What happens if you have an unforeseen medical expense or just an expense in general that you can't afford? And what happens and how do you deal with that? And we talked about how all of this leads to hard choices, which is another thing we talked about in uncertainty, that people with a direct experience of poverty not only 
a choice of heart that they become become unimaginable choices that the choices that you have to make are only dire that the perception is that people in poverty only make poor choices or bad choices but when regardless of what the choices that are in front of them every single one of those will lead to a dire consequence and the the example is so you have a no work no work week no schedule work week and next week here comes you don't get paid so what do you do you how do you pay your rents do you buy food do you buy a winter coat do you pay the heat for your child do you pay the heat um in boston in the winter time it can be four degrees so each one of those things that you skip will you be out on the streets with your family if you don't buy food that's viewed as neglect if you don't buy a winter coat that's viewed as neglect and a put in those choices that are put on people that it's perceived as their fault or it's neglect opposed to be saying, perceiving that this is poverty that's doing it. Um, we also talked about aggravators, the things that make situations of poverty worse for certain groups of people. Um, racism came up over and over again, as Sean was saying. Um, the idea that you were treated differently or left behind just because of who society perceives you to be and what they perceive all those stereotypes to be real based on who you are um how it creates a wealth gap how it creates redlining and redistricting and putting people in certain areas people aren't because their name the way their name sounds on a job application won't be hired and how that affects people's lives we talked about time how people in through the experience of poverty their time is not valued as much as people without the experience of poverty, with the belief being that, well, you're poor, so you must not have a job. So you that means it's okay for you to come back over and over and over again with different forms of paper to qualify for as much needed subsidy. Or the fact that the worst one of all that we talked about was a shot of lifespan, that people with the direct experience of poverty because of the health and well-being concerns that it leads to a shot of lifespan for people. Um, social identity was very big. And the way we talk about that is the idea that how you perceive yourself versus how society perceives you. And it's usually the things that people take pride in. Do you know, I'm an immigrant, I came to this country and I worked hard. Or yes, you know, I'm proud out straight out gay person and all these things that people take pride in is what society usually turns and uses against them um for example and how those things can take you further and further away from your own power and have the result uh, results of placing you deeper and deeper into poverty so if we look at the example of a disabled african-american gay woman and then we look at a straight white male and they both have the same economic standing or background, the woman's experience of poverty will be completely different than that of the male because of the way society looks at those things and hold them against them for social identity. Um, and then the last one that we talked about was accumulation of dimensions that one person, one practitioner in a peer group said, you know, you could probably handle like maybe one or two things that life throws at you or the dimensions, but when they all come out at you together at once, huh. how that, how it ends up, like if you have subjugated and then you lived in a disadvantaged area, the resources and all of these things on top of each other makes it worse. And that can lead to some of the other dimensions that Saran can fill you in a little bit more about, like the struggle. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I guess as I'm hearing you talk, and I'm um, exploring these dimensions a little bit more. Um, I guess what we <clears throat> what we really found also was that um, subjugation is what makes poverty possible, um, and everything that Marianne is kind of sharing 
um, right now is kind of is proof of that. There's you know there's a division that we can come back to that racism provides. Um, there's the 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 division also that you know sexism provides, and that well once we begin that idea of um, separating people from one another and you know you know using one of the dimensions using shame and stigma to you know to save those people over there you know once we start that I guess that's that, that's the idea work of subjugation and that's what makes everything that we've been talking about possible um, the, the the this is, I guess the disadvantaged areas um, makes that possible because you hear that all the time. Even against, you know, native persons against native persons use that. Oh, they're like that. You know, we're like this. And you can see the traces of the, you know, the little, the old time grudges, the ancient grudges that we used to have, you know. Um, but also, I'm hearing what you know our colonizers used against us. You know, like uh, I hear at work a lot of time, oh these Navajos, you know, these Navajos should just stay home. And then I'm like, whoa, Jack, you're a Navajo too, you know? He's like, does that mean you should stay home? Is like, what makes you different? And it's just this this othering, this this creating this divide, you know, that this been coming from an area that's rougher than the place you live in, you know, creates that, uh, you know, creates a, a divide, you know, and it's it's because of subjugation. You know, I always think, would we think this way if we, you know, if Native Americans won the war? You know, like, would our culture have handled this any differently? Because I think this is kind of really where it comes from. Um, also be living in a disadvantaged area might cause you to think differently about yourself. Um, this seems silly, but I think it's true. Um, most every weekend I go back to the reservation. Um, uh, when you go back to the reservation, life is harder. Um, I notice when my daughter comes with me, she changes the way she dresses. You know, she's been out there often enough to where she knows that, you know, when you're out there, it's going to be different. You might have to walk further. You might have to, you know, deal with some harsh conditions. You might be colder than usual. You're, you're going to be out of your comfort zone and out of your element. And just watching her helped me realize, holy cow, I, you know, it's going to be different when I go back. Um, natural resources are harder to get. Um, here to get warm in the city, you turn on your thermostat um, back home you you have to chop wood um, you have to haul propane to for your stove to cook and those aren't readily readily available they, they're they're on a they're on a schedule so if you can't get what you need on a schedule you're going to be suffering a lot um, moving from your home to go get some groceries might be going down the street for most people, but for us, it's traveling 50 miles um, twice, you know, 100 miles a day just to get a little bit of food um, because the food around you is nothing but sugar and starch, you know, and that's, you know, we're, there's a diabetes epidemic here on the Navajo Reservation, and that's great for all the other people that are not Native to point fingers back at you saying, see, this is what this is what you guys get for being who you are. Some people think diabetes is genetic, like only Native Americans get it. You know, same with alcohol. It's like, no, we get these things because we have a piss poor diet. And we've had that same diet since we fought Americans. It's the same food. We're eating the same food. We don't have access because we have, we're in a disadvantaged area. Um, work and employment. Um, you can forget about that being easy. Um, my first jobs were hard jobs. Um, I think at 15, we were put to work at our local chapter house 
which is the little house, the little the little government that takes care of that little tribe in that area. Um, you can go to them for mainly just you depend on them. So we went to them for work, and we worked out in the sun. We did manual labor. We built outhouses um, because maybe they thought we were lazy. I don't know. Uh, that was my first job. It wasn't as hard as most people's first jobs, but, you know, it was constant. Um, I had to hitchhike 24 miles a day for most of my jobs because we didn't have a car because you need money to get a car. And if you don't have money, you have no car. It's just a catch-22. Um, that's how I grew up. Um, right now, I think being able to do those types of jobs... I can survive this job that I'm doing at an old age, an older age. Most people that I work with are younger than me. And because I went through a lot, you know, I can survive it. Um, being socially isolated. <clears throat> and again, I think all of these are connected to subjugation. Again, subjugation is connected to all. But it's just... It's just this is able to work because of subjugation. It's it what makes pof- poverty possible. Uh, one of those other things is social isolation. Um, I see it when I come into town with my brothers. I've heard it when I took friends from um, Force World back home to my house, and then they come back to the place that they've been at for a long time in Gallup. And then they're like, huh, this place feels different. I said, yeah, you, you should try hitchhiking in. <laughs> You'll get the full experience then. You know, it's just once you get here, no one wants you here. And then once you're here, you know that you're not wanted, so you get things done quickly. You know, and all you see are brown people, very few white people. You know, even my daughter made that comment when we went to Chicago. She's like, oh, I'm freaking out. There's so many white people. You know, it's just like I, I want to be back at home. You know, she 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 thinks herself as brown, even though she's half white. You know, again, there's just I think that 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 explains kind of the idea. So when we're here, there's a sea of brown people all mad at each other, all hating on each other because they're all saying the same thing about each other, which is just things that you've heard about yourself. You know, these damn natives. You just get out of here. They just why can't you guys just stay home? Meanwhile, they're all there doing the same thing. You know, it's just a a hostile environment. Um, I've heard people complain about how nobody smiles here. You know, that seems like a rough place. But when I come in from the reservation with my brothers to here, they seem wild just because of their nature. You know, when you have to get up in the middle of the night to go outside to use the bathroom, Every day of your life, you know, that'll, you, you'll be a little bit different. Um, when you don't know, you know, how much food is going to last you for the month, you know, and that's been your whole life. Uh, you don't know when you're going to maybe eat again, you know, how are you going to get food? Well, you're going to seem different when you come into a civilized a social setting. You know, when you ever you're surrounded by dirt and mud and hardship. You're going to dress different. You're going to smell different. You're going to feel differently. And that all adds to that social isolation. That idea that we're different from them. You know, like, oh, they're like that. They're like this. And I've, you know, I've heard that a lot. You know, being with this job six months. You know, this is, and I've heard that with the reporting um, from Virginia, Boston. You know, this this idea of othering. You know, we treat each other differently based on this idea that we are different and we don't know where this comes from. You know, um, it just, it's just, it's just there. And because of it, you know, because that idea that you're, you're less than, you know, because of something that you or your, your people supposedly did, you're going to act and behave differently. You know, you're going to fit the model of a victim, of a, a prisoner. And that social isolation is just, it, that kind of speaks to it. And the most important thing, I think, 
here is the struggle. All how all of that leads to the struggle, this idea that, you know, we don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. Um, that that struggle could be individual, individually with yourself. This, the idea of duality, you know, who who am I inside? Who who's really in charge? This person that I feel that I am, this Native American person, or this other entity that this is who you're supposed to be, that has been handed down like shame, like this, this from your from your from your parents, your grandparents, your ancestors. That point where your your lifeline was disrupted, and everything that you knew to be to be traditional, to be yours, to be original, is gone. Now you're living with this existence, this struggle. How do you get that back? You listen with half knowledge, half truth, you know, half alive, half awake, just trying to figure out what it means to be Native American. Among all these other people saying, no, no, this is what it means to be. You know, and so there's a struggle. There's just, And it's been, I think, at least here, um, I have relatives that, are part of resistance groups that actually go out and fight um, coal industries, um, big coal, uh, water rights, um, and that kind of, that feels to me to be tr answering a, a traditional calling to, to, for the, the the Native American experience, as in being this is who we are. We're not really sure if we're doing it right. You know, because there's this gap, there's access through the language. If you know your language, you have access to it, you know, because the older people have this knowledge. And if you don't have that knowledge, you know, you're separated from it. You're isolated, and it goes back into social isolation. But, you know, there's a struggle. There's this resistance that's there. And, it's you know, there's been the struggle b between... You know, corporations on the land with Native Americans. Um, there's, I think, in the 70s here, there was a big uprising um, to kind of uh, to pe make people aware of what was happening in Gallup, New Mexico, as far as there was so many business owners that had so many liquor licenses and they were making so much money off this this little place. And it had the most millionaires per capita. And this one guy came up and, you know, he challenged that. And he said, you know, that's not right. We need to, you know, why do you all have so many liquor licenses for such a small place? That's insane. And um, he was killed for standing up for his beliefs. And he's kind of a little underground martyr here in Gallup, New Mexico. Um, his last name is Casus, and he was part of the American Indian movement. But you hear other people, other Native Americans talk about that, and it's that idea that he was crazy. You know, like, he's just he's just making trouble. He didn't know his place. You know, good riddance. You know, I mean, he got, he got what he deserved. And that's what struggling brings about. You know, that's what the resistance brings about. That it's not, you're not going to be, you know, patted on the back and regarded as a, a hero or a champion. You're going to be the troublemaker, you know, and you, you fall victim to that. And then you have to make up, you know, which kind of brings it back to me. You have to make this choice to fight and resist and struggle your whole life. And that becomes your life. And to say the right thing and to try to, to do the right thing will get you in trouble a lot of the times. You know, but where do you go with that? Uh, with my last job being outspoken, uh, working by following my integrity, um, making myself available to the community by taking part in MAP and uh, everything you know that I thought was good for my job as an educator got me in a lot of trouble with my peers. And in the end, they turned against me because I was a troublemaker. I was making them work hard. They didn't want to do all this extra stuff they thought was childish. And then now I'm here at this present job where you get bosses treating people unfairly and no one's doing anything. You, you bring it to the boss's attention and they're like, 
okay, well, I will talk about it, and nothing ever happens. And we're talking about sexual harassment, um, theft, you know, all sorts of stuff. And nothing ever happens where it just kind of pushes me back to that mode of like, dang, man, it's like when you were a kid, you know, you, you've been pushed into this corner where you're just like, it's, it's, it's all you. You know, you're going to have to fight and struggle. And the, I guess it creates that divide again. You know, how do you, and how do you expect to live and heal when you know, you're you always feeling the divisions? And I think that's why it's important that we, we talk about struggle here. You know, it's, I don't think I've heard from all across being a part of MAP, maybe the closest to having some sort of struggle that's just huge and, and unavoidable is maybe Virginia with the coal mining and the opioid crisis and maybe the harder places like Oakland, Boston, the hard, rougher places in New York might share in some of the, you know, might share in maybe understanding how, what we can understand about a struggle here and um, in Navajo land, you know, it's just a constant struggle, fighting. Uh, violence is super high here. Um, Gallup is the most violent small town um, in New Mexico, and everyone laughs about that. They think it's not true. Uh, you go on to the res, it's uh, 2015 16, violence was super high. Uh, 256 homicides in a year. You know, that's that, that was like the biggest and like the biggest violent violence rate in all of Indian country, not just Navajo Nation, but all of Indian country. Is it because we're the biggest? I don't know. Um, but everyone laughs at that. They don't think it's true. And that just surprises me at the denial, you know. And I think that's the subjugation that comes from somewhere. So that struggle here, I think it's big, it's real. Um, but no one pays attention to it because there's this thing that people put in your head that if you if you see it and you give you give weight to it, you know, then it's real. Then you're just like all these other crazy people, you know. But there's nothing. There's not. We're not, it's not that bad. There's other places. That's all they ever do. It's not that bad here. You know, the places are worse. And that's what I used to believe until I met people from Queens and Virginia and Boston. I was like those places were rough to me. You know, when you walk the streets of Brooklyn and they're like, oh, this feels like certain places that you're not supposed to be on the reservation, you know? You can feel something in the air. You can smell something in the air. It's not right, you know, so get moving. And I was surprised at that. You know, you heard gunshots in Brooklyn at night. Well, it was no different than here. You know, I was like, wow, I guess, I guess my body was ready for that. You know, you find these little, just traveling and for the past two years and being a part of MAP has, has kind of opened me up to that, with to the struggle and to subjugation, to all these dimensions. You know, it's, it just gives language to what I've been feeling and what we've been going through here. So that's all I want to add. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Marianne. Um, so I think actually that was a really good transition that you ended with there, Sean, um, that we can transition out of the question, I guess, of what to do with this research and what kind of are the impacts of what we've, what we've discussed and what we've been finding in this discussions. Um, and so I'm going to pass the floor on to Donna Haig Friedman. Donna is a member of the national research team based in Boston. She's going to be talking about implications for the research for policymakers, researchers, and anybody really working in, in organizations alongside uh, people living in poverty. So, Donna? I spent most of my professional life in human services or in social policy and in, in participative action research. And um, participating in this research project was 
quite transformative for me. Um, and I'm imagining that those of you who are participating in this webinar um, may have a sense of overwhelmness from the complexity and the intensity and the seriousness of, um, of the experience of poverty and the ways in which it touches every aspect of life for those people who are most affected. Certainly every aspect of policy making. There isn't just one solution. Um, I, I want to offer some thoughts which have to do with, think for me, the lenses I now use when I think about solutions are to what kind of dignity, respect, sense of control, actual control, will this solution enable especially those communities who are most directly affected? What is the participation of those people who are most directly affected in a policy issue? How real and authentic is it in the actual um, development of solutions? How, how does a solution measure up with respect to autonomy and control that people can have over their own lives? Um, with respect to breaking down the, the walls of isolation and building bridges across all of the divides that you've heard about today. In what way will these solutions actually be shame-proof and stigma-proof? What I think this requires from all of us, no matter what our perch in life is, um, is to look at the areas of our own lives where we have influence as researchers, as people who advocate for solutions to poverty, as neighbors, as employers, how can our actions be ones that build community, that reduce the barriers, that lead to stigma and shame-proof resolutions and enable us to be human being to human being um, better off. I want to just end with a, um, a saying that I have found to be very inspirational and helpful to myself over many years. Um, and it's attributed to an Aboriginal group in uh, Australia, and it goes something like this, and I think it fits very well for what um, I know I learned and what all of you know my teammates learned in this research project. And here it is. If you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. If you've come because your liberation is bound up in my liberation, then let's walk together. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, so we'd like to, we ran a bit over time, of course, as, as people always do in these things. Um, we would like to take a moment just for, for q and A. If people have any questions, put them in the chat. Like we said, uh, Carolyn is paying attention. Um, I thought I was just gonna take one second though to hijack uh, everything and maybe ask a first question to Guillaume and give him a chance to, um, finish up and conclude what he was saying. Guillaume, I don't know where exactly you were cut off, but if there was maybe one thing of like all the methodological presentation, the one thing you wish that people went away with at the end of this, one thing you wish they knew, uh, what would that be? What would you want to say? Yeah, thank you, Dave, and sorry about, um, about that. I mean, my, my next point after being, I mean, uh, presenting a little bit about the leading block of, uh, of this research around the, the, the U.S. research team. Uh, my next point was to, to, to tell a little bit more about the, the building blocks, which means uh, the peer groups and where the knowledge actually comes from. So you may remember that there is these three streams of knowledge and all of those streams were implemented in six, uh, in six locations in the U.S. and shown 
mention a few a few of them. Uh, we have so New York, New York City, Boston, uh, Virginia in the Appalachian region, a Gallup in New Mexico, and and, uh, and New Orleans. And so from each of these places, the people, I mean groups between five to eight uh, people each time work together for uh, four session, maybe two between two and three hours a session to to, ident to determine, identify and define and rank the, the, the dimensions of poverty through the activities that were developed by the, the US research team. And we have 23 peer groups uh, across the country. And that was the, the, the material that the US research team used to, 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 to be led to this uh, conclusion, to be led to, to our results. Results that were, that were uh, validated, reviewed and validated during a, a national seminar. So there is a lot of feedback mechanism also in this participatory research. And uh, that was really built in a, in a dialogue between the US research team and the, the multiple peer groups across the country. Thank you, Dave, for giving me, giving me the opportunity to finish my sentence. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. And maybe that's, um, I don't know if uh, Guillermo or Marianne, but either of you might like to say a word just about kind of what next steps are going forward. I'd be curious to hear. Um, Dave, you're muted, yeah. Yeah. Um, just here, maybe a second thoughts. We heard a bit from Donna about what the um, about what uh, the implications are of this research, but maybe um, somebody can speak a bit about what exactly what plans are going forward and where you guys see the map project going from here. Donna, would you like to give a little feedback or? Okay, um, then one of the next steps that we're very excited about right now is in New York City that they've developed a social worker co-training or co-learning program that is using the same methodology where we have the three groups and the three streams of knowledge that come to um, activists, academics, and practitioners that come together. So people that are studying social work are in school now learning how to be social workers and training to be social workers can come together and talk and create dialogues where it's not the dynamic of clients and social worker are, you know, it's just to have open dialogues together and learn about how to work together. Um, so that's one of the various things that we're very much excited about. And that we also think that that once that training is fully developed and completed, that it can be adapted to anybody who works with vulnerable populations. Um, it could be healthcare workers, police departments, school, K through 12. Um, policymakers would benefit from that very greatly also, um, because if you're making policy about people, you should have firsthand knowledge and relationships with them. Um, we're also talking about having a national gathering in 2020 around October 17th, which is the International Day of, Rec international Day of Recognition for Extreme Poverty. Um, it's usually done at, on, at the UN in New York City, but we're, and this year we're also going to have a side gathering. And, but, and just reaching out and working with people also in the locations, asking them what they would like to do and how they can see bringing this going forward um, because like one of the things that we really want to do is like we know poverty is multi-dimensional we want solutions to be multi-dimensional also and as far as that in oakland they have developed a, a resolution that can be have it be recognized on local state and hopefully federal level that yes multi-dimensional poverty is real, that these results are real, and that this is how we have to look at poverty if we're gonna come up with solutions. Um, Guillaume, Donna, is there anything else you'd like to add or expand upon? Sorry, Donna, I saw you talking, but your microphone was off, so you have to say it again, sorry. I have nothing to add. I thought you covered it well, Marianne. Yeah, I thought you did too. 
Um, so then maybe, I guess, actually, the, but Don, I am going to put you on the spot, um, because I know you were in France lately for the event at the OECD, and maybe you could just say a word or two about the international side of the report. I know that we've been all been involved much more in the U.S., but just about what the event was at the OECD in France, and then if either of you, I don't know if Gio, maybe you have a better sense of what the next steps are on the international side. I think it'd be good for Guillaume or Marianne to talk about the OEC, OECD event. I wasn't there. Oh, okay, I get mixed up, sorry. <laughs> I'll leave that up to Guillaume. Okay, thank you. So, the OEC is, uh, the, is this group of 27 uh, countries coming together to, to think about which kind of growth do we want. And, uh, and to promote uh, an inclusive growth, inclusive growth. So that's a very important uh, platform for, for uh, to, to advocate for the change we want to, to happen. We were welcomed by the Secretary General of uh, the OECD uh, in presence also of people from the World Bank, uh, people from uh, the, the French uh, Statistical Department and Ministry which is, I mean, some, I mean, so some very important uh, people. And together, they really realized that uh, we need to develop a new initiative in terms of measurements to be able to capture the, the, the complexity of uh, the reality of the extent of poverty. And uh, so the Secretary, General, the Secretary General of the OCD really pushed us and pushed all the institutions that were there to, to dare to, to imagine what uh, indicators could look like uh, to, to measure uh, the dimensions that were identified at the international level. So the, the, those dimensions are a bit different than the US one because it, it, it takes into account uh, six, the reality of six countries. And they, they, they do it uh, according to three uh, uh, All right, looks like he almost gotten frozen again. Um, <laughs> anyway, we'll take that as uh, as our cue. Maybe I noticed people have started checking out. It's, we've gone way, way over time. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. And please do check out uh, map.fourthworldmovement.org to learn more about the report, download it, and I hope we'll see some of you again on uh, June 26th for our event on subjugation on the international side. Uh, thank you all very much, and uh, take care.